Hi everybody, um, my name is Hannah Horowitz. I'm a fourth year graduate student in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences here at Harvard. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about my research and the basis for my research, which is looking at mercury in the environment and the human impacts on that. So I'll briefly just go through and orient you for what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so first, I'll just give background on what mercury is and why we care about studying mercury. Um, then I'll focus in on where mercury in fish comes from. Next, I'll um, focus on a specific source of mercury to the environment, which is from mercury mining and its use. And then finally, I'll end with looking at the overall human impact on mercury in the environment and looking towards the future, what we can expect. Okay, so first, what is mercury? Um, it's a natural element. Does anyone recognize what this figure might represent here? It's a pun. Anyone? Periodic Yes, this is the periodic table. But what is this little mercury guy in the middle here? Anyone? Oh, it's Freddie. Yeah, it's Freddie Mercury from Queen. So, so I really like this little. Yeah. But yeah, so it's one of the natural elements in our periodic table. Um, and it's mined from cinnabar which is mercury sulfide, and it's an el this mineral um, is in these rocks here, so it has this characteristic red color. And in really rich cinnabar ore, you can see actually droplets of liquid mercury oozing out of the rocks. So this is where it's uh, predominantly occurring in nature. And mercury has a lot of really unique physical and chemical properties which is why there's so many applications that take advantage of these. So one that I've already alluded to with the picture of the rock with the liquid mercury is it's actually the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. And so I'm going to be introducing a bunch of applications of mercury and many of them take advantage of this unique um, property. It's also very dense and has a high surface tension, which makes it useful for measuring devices because you don't want it to stick to the glass. For example, in a thermometer or a barometer here measuring pressure, since it's so dense, um, you don't need as large of a column to measure changes in pressure. So it's really useful for that, for example. It also can amalgamate with gold and silver easily. And what that means is it's essentially dissolving these precious metals and binding with them. And so one of the uses for this property is actually in our dental fillings, the silver fillings. So these are actually a silver mercury amalgam. So the liquid properties of mercury make it really easy to form into these fillings. And it's actually an amalgam. It also makes it very useful for gold and silver extraction or mining. And I'm showing here some pictures of what we refer to as artisanal and small scale gold mining, or abbreviated ASGM. And so this is where there's individuals or small groups informally mining for gold using liquid mercury. Um, and so how you take advantage of mercury's properties in this is not only that it dissolves the gold so you can mix it with whatever rocks or soil you have that you think there's gold in, it'll bind to the gold and then because it's so dense it can settle out and so you can separate easily the gold containing soils from the not gold containing soils. And there's another property of mercury that is useful for this, which has a very low boiling point relative to other metals especially. And so then after you have your mercury gold amalgam, you can burn the mercury off at pretty low temperatures and just be left with um, the gold or silver itself. So it can evaporate like other liquids like water. It also conducts electricity well, but it's a poor conductor of heat. So there's a few different electronic uses of mercury, electric uses of mercury, excuse me. Um, so up here I'm showing a picture of a switch. So if you flip this switch up and down and this bead of liquid mercury can either connect or disconnect that circuit of these, these wires here. It's also used in fluorescent lights and has been used in batteries as well. Another major use of mercury that takes advantage of its ability to conduct electricity is the electrolytic production of 
chlorine and lye. So you can take a salt water solution, um, charge it up, use mercury as the cathode, so sort of like the other end of a battery, and it can actually separate the chlorine from and sodium. Um, in addition, mercury has antifungal properties and can be used as a preservative in a variety of applications. So, um, for example, in things like paint or wood pulp that you're turning into paper, you don't want mold and other things growing in it. Um, so you can use mercury, has been used in the past to prevent this from happening. Or also as a coating on seeds. So again, if you're transporting seeds, you don't want them to um, be, have fungus growing on them before you can plant them. And it's also an important preservative in vaccines, which can allow vaccines to be transported globally without needing refrigeration or to areas that don't have good refrigeration. So it's really important to allow people across the world um, to be able to receive vaccines. Um, it also, as you may have guessed from the brightly colored red rocks I showed earlier, um, it forms really brightly colored compounds. And so if you powder those rocks up, you get what's called vermilion, and this is used in different cultural practices and also artworks, for example. And this has been going, this use has been going back in time for a long time. Um, so I've already sort of alluded to this, but just to really be specific about it. These different uses use different forms of mercury. And so there's also different forms of mercury in the environment, which I'll get to later. And so one is just the pure elemental mercury. So this is what liquid mercury is. It's just mercury on its own. It's not bound to anything else. And that's the form that's found in things like thermometers. Um, it's actually the dominant type of mercury that's found in the air because it has this low boiling point it easily can evaporate so and it's stable in this form in the air as well but it's not really water soluble so it doesn't dissolve in water and that's another reason why it's the dominant form in the atmosphere and it does have health effects but they require very high levels of exposure so around 200 times the average concentration in the air in this room would be needed to observe any health effects but those if someone would be exposed to those levels over a long period of time it can have effects on your lungs or respiratory system liver and also your nervous system and so one example of someone who might be exposed to that, this is a picture uh, from National Geographic back in the 60s of a mercury miner. And this was sort of before people realized that mercury was so toxic. And so he's actually floating on top of a massive pool of liquid mercury. And like water, this mercury is evaporating slowly to the air. So he probably would be exposed to some of these high levels. But generally, um, we don't experience this anymore. And then there's the mercury compounds. So there's mercury um, bound to other elements. And these are the types of things that are used as preservatives or antifungal agents, like I showed earlier. And these are water soluble, so they can dissolve in water. And there are also health effects from these types, but again, they require very large exposures. And so, and they have a slightly different pathway through the body. So if you ingested large quantities of these mercury compounds, then they could get into your bloodstream um, and have effects on your kidneys. And another uh, way of exposure is actually through skin. So the FDA has warned that there are some of these skin bleaching creams out there that contain extremely high amounts of mercury. So if you were applying this to your skin on a regular basis, you could start to see uh, discoloration and other uh, issues with your skin as well. But although these types of compounds are, and elemental mercury are more abundant in the environment, they do not accumulate in our bodies. So because of the different, because of uh, what these chemicals are like, our body is able to degrade them pretty rapidly and eliminate them. And so that's why you need to have extremely high exposures to have any effect, because otherwise it would just be removed from your body very quickly. And so in general, when we talk about health effects from mercury, we focus on methylmercury, because this is the form that accumulates in the body. And I'll, I'll describe this in more detail later on, um, and it's also the most toxic form. And so why is it so toxic? So 
It's because of this chemical formula here that allows it to mimic an essential amino acid in your body. And so your body thinks that it's supposed to be there, and so it gets transported throughout your bloodstream. It can cross the blood-brain barrier. It can also um, go from a mother to a fetus. And so um, that cause allows it to have health effects um, such as nervous system effects and in the fetus it can lead to IQ deficits or developmental deficits. And there's some evidence that in adults that are exposed to this methylmercury it could uh, impact heart disease but there's less evidence for that so far. And as I said, it's long lived in humans and other organisms, which allows it to build up over time. And so you might only be exposed to a small amount at a time, but it lasts for a long time in your body, so it can build up to these toxic levels a lot more easily than the other types of mercury I mentioned before. <coughs> and so when we talk about methylmercury and human exposure, it's coming from eating fish that contains methylmercury. And so this is just an example of one area in California that has a lake with contaminated fish in it. And um, in all 50 states, there's these type of fish consumption advisories, either for specific lakes or coastlines, um, warning about the levels of uh, mercury in fish that are caught in those waters. So um, I'll leave us with a question that I will get to after our question break. But why is there this methylmercury in fish in the first place? Where does it come from? How does it get from these rocks that it's found in into the fish that we might eat? And so this is something I'll come back to, as I said, after the break. So to briefly summarize what I've introduced so far, what is mercury and why do we care? So we know that it naturally occurs in rocks and it has unique and useful properties, which is why it's used in different products. And there's different forms of mercury that have different health effects and require different levels of exposure for those health effects. Um, but we care most about methylmercury because it's not only the most toxic form, but it also can accumulate in organisms and humans. And so you can get higher levels of exposure and humans are generally exposed to it by eating contaminated fish. And so after the question break, I will answer this question in more detail of where the mercury in fish comes from, and I'll uh, also focus on a particular source of mercury to the environment, which is from the mercury that's mined and then used in different applications. So I'll take any questions at this point. Mm -hmm. Will you be talking about where methylmercury Will I be talking about where methylmercury comes from? I will briefly, um, I won't go into great detail, but after the break I will talk about how that methylmercury is created. Mm -hmm. Is it just the elemental mercury that's in thermometers and switches, or is that the methylmercury? So in thermometers and switches, it's just the elemental mercury. So um, at various points in the past, there was methylmercury used in manufacturing, um, sort of back in the 50s, but there were some really terrible poisoning incidents, for example, in Japan, where there was this compound actually being used, but in general, um, it's not used in applications, so it has to be formed in the environment. So when they tell you that if you break a thermometer, you have to call the biohazard people, that's not really... Well, relevant. that would be if because the mercury can evaporate from the liquid into the vapor, depending on, for example, if you had a not, maybe your house wasn't very well ventilated or it was in a small room, perhaps the concentrations could build up to those levels. Like I was saying, you need about 200 times the average level in the room. So that's, that's because of that. And if you did have a bunch of spills that you didn't really realize about, the mercury could just be kind of sitting in the carpet and slowly evaporating, so you just need to be careful with that. You don't want it to build up. Yes? So, um, like, let's say I break a thermometer by accident. Um, if this mercury gets onto, like, my hand, and I wash it, and I call the biohazard, um, could it come through my skin and, like, be a threat to my uh, body, or is it just because it's elemental and not not like it does it hasn't evaporated yet but it's just there on right so my skin could that be dangerous to my health 
Okay, so I'm just going to repeat the question. I was forgetting to do that. So you were asking about if, mer if elemental mercury, for example, from a broken thermometer was on your skin, if that could directly impact your health. And the answer is for elemental mercury, the pathway that it gets into your bloodstream is through the lungs. So, oops, so you have to breathe in the vapors. Um, so if it was just on your skin and you weren't like breathing in a lot of what was evaporating, then it would be okay. Um, I noticed in the picture of the boy that was um, doing the, I guess, the process and mercury was evaporating in his shirt over his nose. Yes. Does that prevent mercury from going into your lungs? Or so, something more biohazardy than that? Yeah, so um, that is a big problem with this small scale gold mining. That probably wouldn't be very effective. And so, one big effort right now is to reach out to these communities and provide them with what's called a retort, which is kind of like if you just put a plate over where you're burning it, the mercury droplets will condense on the plate in the liquid form, and so that will prevent it from getting in the vapor form into your mouth. Um, but there's some more sophisticated devices, but even if you just use like a ceramic plate. But I don't know, I don't think the shirt probably is enough. So it's showing that this person knows something that mercury is toxic, but hasn't been informed enough perhaps, or has made the cost-benefit analysis that they want to make money from this process or something like that. So it's a big concern right now. Mm -hmm. I had a question, because when you first started talking, you were talking about some industrial uses of uh, mercury like in, in switches and mm -hmm. um, as preservatives. For, yeah. Is that still the case? Because I know there's you know, all these issues with vaccines, and so are they still doing that, or is that, that you were just sort of talking about historically speaking, it was used in these things, but it's not used so much anymore? Right. Okay, so um, your question was about whether these uses of mercury I mentioned are predominantly from the past or if there's any that are still being used today. And so it varies for things like um, batteries, for example. Uh, there's only one type of battery now that still uses mercury and that certain types of those circular ones that are for hearing aids and things like that. But in the past, they would have been used in all types of different batteries. Um, so there's a lot of uses that have been phased out. Um, there's some where there still is mercury used, so one of those is vaccines. Um, and the reason for that is there's been a lot of studies that show that the amount that you're getting into your body, which again is this much less toxic form of mercury to begin with, and it's also very small. So they were trying to see, estimate how much mercury you would be getting into your body from that. Um, and they decided that the benefits of being able to provide vaccines all over the world outweighed this. And so they haven't um, phased it out of all vaccines. In the US, it's phased out of most of them except the flu vaccine. Um, but right now for developing countries and things like that, it's definitely the most cost effective option and there doesn't seem to be any adverse effects. But it has been phased out of other things like batteries, um, I'm trying to think of other examples. Sort of the, the, more, the more toxic uh, possibilities. Um, yeah. Okay, all right, so now I'm going to get into answering this question about where mercury and fish comes from. And so I'll start out with looking at the natural cycle of mercury in the environment. So without humans existing, what would it look like? And so you start out with mercury, like I mentioned earlier, is naturally in these rocks. Um, but through processes like volcanoes and weathering of rocks, so if you have a rock exposed at the surface and it rains and different chemicals can process that rock, it can actually uh, release the mercury into the atmosphere. Um, and volcanoes are a larger way of doing that, exploding uh, the mercury into the atmosphere. And once mercury is in the atmosphere, um, it can be transported near globally, depending on the chemical form. But if it's in the elemental form, which is what natural emissions are, um, it can be transported almost globally through the air. And it can exchange um, with soil. So it can be deposited to vegetation and soil, um, be taken up, and then also can be re-emitted back into the atmosphere. And it can be converted into this water-soluble form in the atmosphere. 
under natural processes. And so at that point, it might be able to be rained out um, because it can dissolve in the rainwater and end up in the ocean or on land. And eventually, um, this mercury in the ocean, how it's removed and gets back into the rocks to close the cycle, it has to sink to the bottom of the ocean when it, it can be attached to particles and gradually sink to the bottom of the ocean and then is taken out in sediments. And eventually, those sediments through plate tectonics and other processes will reform these rocks and the mercury will be sequestered again. And so, just to summarize that process, I'm putting arrows here, and one thing I didn't specifically mention is that rivers can also transport mercury from soils into the ocean. And so now, how has human activity modified this mercury cycle? And so the main way of thinking about this is um, through human activity like industrial processes, mining of mercury and other metals that co-occur with mercury, for example gold, and also fossil fuel burning, so coal burning for example, um, it trans essentially is transferring more mercury from these long-lived rocks into the air. And so it's essentially increasing the amount of mercury that's cycling at the surface. And I didn't draw these arrows to mean any scale, um, but I'll get late, later on in the talk, I'll try to estimate the relative size of the natural um, flows in the environment versus the human flows. But um, so what we're seeing today is a combination of the human influence and uh, the natural emissions. And there can also be, in addition to uh, these types of emissions to the air from human activity, um, there can also be direct releases to land and water. So from different uh, chemical plants, for example, that might use mercury in their manufacturing process and end up with wastes, they could be disposed of in ways that would allow them to um, interact with the soil and water. And so because of human activity, we think that today the deposition, so essentially the down arrows here to the surface of the earth, um, is increased about a factor of three to five times since the 1800s. And um, I'll be referring to this as anthropogenic uh, influence, meaning the effect of human activities. Okay, so this is uh, focusing on the other forms of mercury, not methyl mercury. So this is just looking at things like elemental mercury and then other mercury compounds that can cycle in this way. And so now I'm going to link it to how it gets to that methyl mercury form. Um, so when mercury is in aquatic environments like freshwater systems or the ocean, it can be converted to methyl mercury by bacteria. And um, so this will result in generally uh, about 1% or less of the mercury in the water is uh, converted to this methyl mercury form by certain types of bacteria. And this is, this is a natural process, but it's just been increased if we increase the amount that's in the ocean, for example. And so if you start out with one unit of methyl mercury in the water, um, by the time you get to the types of fish that we might eat, it's, the concentration is magnified millions of times. And again, this has to do with the long lifetime of methylmercury. And so at the base of the food chain, the plankton is processing all of this water that contains trace amounts of methylmercury, but each time it's retaining a lot of that methylmercury. And then as you go up the food chain, insects and insect eating fish, they're eating a lot of these um, for their diet and they're retaining most of the methylmercury. So by the time you get up to fish eating fish, uh, the concentrations have increased a lot. And so these are the types of fish that we worry about for human exposure. And so this is also why fish is essentially the only way we're exposed because this methylation can only happen in these aquatic environments. And so um, you're not you would only be exposed to something that is involved in an aquatic food chain. Okay, so now I'm going to influence, uh, introduce this question, which I'll come back to uh, by the end of the talk, and I'll try to answer. So how much of this mercury in the ocean and in fish 
is naturally occurring and how much is from anthropogenic activities. And so you might think maybe the answer is easy. Oops. Uh, because we know that today, most of the mercury that's emitted to the atmosphere is coming from human activities like industry, mining, and fossil fuels, which is about 200 times, sorry, about 20 times greater than the emissions from natural processes like weathering of rocks and volcanic eruptions. But the answer is not that simple. So what's happening today at the present moment isn't enough to explain what we're seeing in the ocean. And this is because it takes a really long time for mercury to be removed from the surface environment. And so we call this the long legacy of mercury. Um, so if you look at the fate of mercury that is emitted to the air over time. And I'm just going to show a few different time slices. So after one year, um, most of it has already been removed from the air, so it's been exchanging with the soil and the ocean, like in that diagram I showed before. Um, and after 10 years, some of it has managed to get onto particles in the ocean and settle out to the, to the sediments. But a lot of it is still uh, being transported around the ocean and there still is some in soils as well. And even after 100 years, there still is over 40% of this initially emitted mercury that still is cycling the ocean, um, gradually settling down to the bottom to be in the sediments. And so we see now that mercury is remaining in the ocean for decades to centuries. So we can't just make a statement about how much mercury in fish is natural based on what's happening today. We need to use a model to connect what's been going on in the past in order to comment on the present. And so I'm going to focus on one type of these historical sources that we want to keep track of in order to, to get at this question since the mercury is cycling around the ocean for so long. So as I've already alluded to, mercury has been used for thousands of years. And we have a couple different ways of getting evidence for this. And one of them is sediment cores. And so a sediment core is uh, generally this cylindrical core taken from the bottom of a lake, for example. And so this would be the top at the lake surface, and this is the bottom. And you're going back in time as you go deeper into the sediments. And so you can take these, you can date them at different levels, so you can get a sense of um, how old the material is, and you can also measure things like mercury, for example. And so what I'm showing on this plot is the ratio of mercury uh, in the sediment to what they're defining as the natural levels. And so this is going back to around 2000 BC, they see these constant levels of mercury, and then it starts to increase at 1600 BC. So, and they know that this is occurring with a particular culture in this area. This is coming from Peru. Um, that they have evidence, other archeological evidence that they were using vermilion, for example. They were crushing up the mercury containing rocks and using it in pottery. Um, and so you can see that already, thousands of years ago, there's an increase above the natural levels. And it kind of stays constant until we get to the more recent period during the Inca time and also the colonial influence when we then began to have gold and silver mining that was using mercury. And you can see it really skyrockets up during this time. And again, we have other types of evidence that mercury has been used for a long time. And this is just an illustration from a book from the 1500s that was showing how to use mercury to extract gold. And this is around when uh, this process first began to be developed. So around the world, um, there's mercury mines in very specific locations. And this is because mercury only occurs in high quantities in specific areas, and that depends on the geology and plate tectonics. And so you see there's these regions um, in Europe, Asia, South America, and the west coast of the United States, where you have enough mercury to actually mine it. Um, and a lot of these mines have to do with the gold rush um, in the western U.S. 
And I'm highlighting two here. So one of them is Almadain, which is the largest mercury mine in the world. And there's evidence that it's been operated for 2,000 years. It's no longer in operation. And this mine actually provided one third of all mercury in the world just from this one single mine. And this inspired a, goal, a mercury mine in the western coast of the US um, called New Almadane. They had very high hopes for this mercury mine back in the 1800s. And this is actually where this um, contaminated fish sign is from. So in this particular area, because they had this historical mercury mining, they're still seeing elevated levels of mercury in fish there. Okay, so looking at the whole sum of all the mercury that's been mined since 1850. And this is some uh, work that I did with some collaborators for my research, is trying to estimate how much mercury was mined globally. And it's actually pretty well constrained because there's so many records of mercury trade, for example, that's kept by the US Geological Survey. Because it was such a valuable commodity, there's pretty good records of how much was being mined. And so in total, this amounts to 720,000 megagrams since 1850, or 1.6 billion pounds. And so my question is, where did all this mercury go? And this question actually was not fully answered until very recently. And so as I mentioned before, it's used in a variety of different products. So we start with the total mercury that's mined. And we know that it's used in all different kinds of applications, like gold mining or um, fluorescent light bulbs and things like that. And then each of these different uses of mercury has the potential to release mercury to the environment. So to fully answer this question, we have to figure out what the mercury was used in and then during that use or the disposal of that product, how did, it, did any of it end up in the air or land or water? Or was it landfilled? For example, if the batteries that contained mercury were thrown away and ended up in a landfill. And some of it um, in manufacturing processes might have been recycled and returned to the mercury supply and then can continue to be used in different products. And so I'll get back to um, results from this after intermission. Um, so to quickly summarize, uh, earlier we talked about what mercury is and why we care. And now I've tried to answer the question of where mercury and fish comes from. And so we know that today um, there's a combination of natural and anthropogenic sources of mercury in the environment. And today it, it, we think anthropogenic sources are about 20 times higher than the natural sources from volcanoes and weathering of rocks. And once mercury is in aquatic environments, it can be converted to this toxic bioaccumulative form called methylmercury by bacteria. And then this will get magnified up the food chain to the types of fish that we might eat. And we also know now that mercury emitted to the air can persist in the ocean for centuries. So we need to take look at a historical perspective in order to answer this question for today. And then focusing in on mercury mining and use, we've seen that there's massive quantities. So like I said, 1.6 billion pounds over the last 150 years that have been mined and used. Um, and this actually goes back very far in time. And we need to account for how each of these uses have the potential to release mercury to the environment. And so up next, I'll answer this question of what we think the human impact on mercury in the environment has been, specifically from these mining related uses and looking towards the future, what we can expect for environmental levels of mercury. So now it's intermission, but feel free to ask questions. You can take some questions and then break for intermission. Sure. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. So they've been mining mercury for a really long time. Is it, are there any documented, um, uh, I guess, observances of mercury poisoning or yes. birth effects of mercury? Yeah, there are. So, um, for example, that mine in Spain, sorry, just to repeat her question for people listening at home, uh, she was asking about whether mercury uh, poisoning from all this mercury mining has ever been observed in the past. And so that really big mercury mine in Spain um, 
they actually started sending prisoners there because they often would die before their prison sentence was up because of the mercury poisoning. Um, and there's evidence that the Romans were using slaves to mine mercury, for example. So there is evidence of this, but I guess not all the dots were really connected until more recently. Yes, so her question was whether mercury compounds can occur naturally. And so, under natural conditions without any human influence, the emissions to the atmosphere are in the elemental form, so from volcanoes, for example. But then, um, once they're in the atmosphere, there's different chemical processes that can convert them to different compounds. So, you can end up with mercury bound to other things in the environment. And there would be small levels of mercury naturally in the ocean because we have these volcanic eruptions and things like that. And we think there's always been bacteria that have been converting it to the methyl mercury form. Um, so, it's just a question of now, uh, what are the levels today and how much of that is because of human influence? So how much can we have a control over versus how much is naturally occurring? Does that answer your question? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little confused about that. I think at one time you said mercury doesn't mix with water. Right. But then you said that it can come down as rain because yes. of the that does. Yeah, so there's we can think of two different types of mercury. So when mercury exists just on its own, so like the type that's in your thermometer, the liquid pure mercury, um, or the vapor that's coming off of that liquid, and it's just more elemental mercury, it's not bound to anything, that doesn't dissolve in water very easily. Um, but then if it is bound to other uh, elements, and so it's, a, it's, it's in a compound form, it generally is pretty soluble in water. So it's the other, what it's bound to kind of gets into the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I wasn't clear on that. But. Okay, so now we'll have a brief intermission. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, so getting back to what I introduced just before intermission. Um, my research is looking at where all the mercury that was mined ended up. And so to do this, I first um, determined, along with my collaborators, what the mercury was used in over time. And so we consulted as much historical documents as we could, um, as many data sources as we could to try to estimate this. Um, and so try to figure out in each decade, for example, how much mercury was used in gold mining versus other products like batteries or light bulbs and things like that. And then from there, for each of those mercury uses, we tried to estimate um, how much ended up in the atmosphere versus water or released to land or ended up in landfills. And when we did this analysis for the, this whole historical period, um, looking at all the different uses, uh, we came up with this picture. And so, before I go there, I just want to point out, so this, the, the peak uh, mercury mined in a given decade is over 8,000 megagrams um, per year. And when we look at where all the mercury ended up, this shape is not exactly the same as the previous plot I showed. And that's for a couple different reasons. So one of those reasons is that some of the mercury is recycled. And so some mercury that was mined and then used, for example, in this chlorine manufacturing, some of that can be recycled and not be released to the environment for a long time afterwards. And different products like um, thermostats, for example, or other very long-lived measuring devices would sort of smooth out this curve and delay some of the releases to later after the mercury had been initially mined. And so you'll see, though, that it still is a pretty high peak of mercury that's released to these surface environments like water, soil, and air um, over time. And But the peaks generally follow uh, how much mercury was mined. So there's this peak 
in the 1890s associated with the gold rush and um, a peak in the 1970s when there was a lot of different consumer products that were using mercury. Um, and then we see a decline because of various poisoning events, like I mentioned in Japan, that got a lot of attention and started regulating the mercury that was being mined and used. And so we see a decline after that. And there's also a secondary peak um, during World War II because of uses associated with that, with chemicals production, for example. And uh, just to put this in perspective again, um, so this is in terms of megagrams, uh, and it's in the thousands of megagrams that are being released. And if we think about the natural emissions from volcanoes and weathering of rocks, those are only about 100 megagrams per year. So this is a lot of mercury that's being released. And so to look in a little more detail about each of these environmental reservoirs that the mercury is being released into and what products could contribute to that. So if we look at the air, and again on the x-axis is going through time, um, we see that there's this huge spike in the amount of air, air releases of mercury from this mercury that's mined, and again that's because of the gold and silver rushes of the late 1800s. And we see um, another somewhat surprising peak that we weren't expecting to find in the 1970s associated with paint. And so as I mentioned earlier, mercury was used as a preservative in paint. Um, and we found a bunch of studies from this time period that showed that as the paint was drying or if it was an outdoor paint and was exposed to rain, a lot of the mercury either evaporated or got dissolved in the rainwater. And so this ended up being a large source of mercury to the atmosphere during this time. But by the 1990s, um, in most places, mercury and paint had been outlawed. Um, and so in the US, there was the EPA canceled all the registrations of the mercury compounds in paint by 1990. Um, and then there's this contribution from batteries, and you might think, how do batteries emit mercury to air? And that's because of waste incineration. So if a lot of batteries uh, containing trace amounts are disposed of in an area that uses waste incineration for its waste treatment, you can end up with a lot of mercury in air. And then uh, in the present day, we see this big increase from this artisanal and small-scale gold mining, um, like I showed in the picture of the person just burning the mercury off with a flame from the gold. And if we look at water, um, it's a slightly different picture. And so one thing to note is that the peak in the releases to water actually occurred in the 1960s and not in the 1970s. Even though the 1970s was the peak mercury mined and the peak mercury used, um, there actually already started to be some regulations of a lot of these industries, like uh, the chlorine production industry, because they had observed some local effects on fish and uh, wildlife in those areas where they were releasing a lot of mercury to water. So by 1970, a lot of these sources to water had already been regulated. And so the peak is in the 60s instead. And as I mentioned, there was a lot of um, chemicals production during World War II that used mercury. And we see the same two mining peaks um, from this elemental mercury that was just dumped into water and, uh, as it was being used in the mining. And if we move on to soil, um, again, we see the same mining peaks, um, but now we have a significant contribution from pesticides and these seed protectants, like I showed earlier, where you have a coating on the seeds to prevent fungus from growing. And it also, at various points, was used as a fertilizer. So again, this is being directly applied to land or um, released to land. And uh, there's some... Uh, mercury released to soil from batteries, and this is from more informal methods of waste disposal. So before um, more high-tech waste incinerators, if people were just burning the waste in their own yard and dumping the ashes onto the ground, for example. And we start to see more of the mercury that used to be released in water from the chlorine production once, after you get to the 1970s, now it's being released onto land because there were these regulations specifically targeting water, so they tended to create sludges and just dump it onto the land near the plant. 
And then finally, looking at landfilled mercury. So this mercury is a lot more uh, sequestered from the environment because it's encased in a landfill. And so we see this huge signal uh, from batteries. Um, and this shape is a combination of the mercury that was used in batteries and also the development of landfills. So before this time, you had more that was just directly released to land because landfills weren't really developed until the 1960s in the way that we know them today. And then this decline again is because, not because there's fewer batteries being produced, but because the mercury use in batteries has been replaced with other materials. Okay, so now we have an idea of how much of this mined mercury ended up in the environment. And we want to use this to look at that question I posed earlier, which is how much mercury in the environment is natural versus anthropogenic. And so to do this, um, we take our conceptual understanding of the mercury cycle and we can create a computer model um, and we can call this a box model. So we essentially represent um, the atmosphere and the ocean and the soils as different boxes that are exchanging with each other. And based on observations and more sophisticated modeling, we can come up with the rates of, at which the mercury flows between these different boxes. And so once we do that, um, we can use our computer to calculate what we think the natural levels would be um, based on what the exchange rates uh, we've determined are. And so we don't have any uh, human releases included in this version of the model. And once we do that, then we can repeat this, except now we'll do a time-dependent analysis and we'll add in all of those different sources of mercury to the air and to soil and water. And then we can, again, solve over time for how much mercury is in the environment in the present day after we've accounted for all of the mercury inputs. And then we can compare our results for the natural case and the anthropogenic case. And so, um, since uh, my work indicated that there was a lot more mercury released to the environment that hadn't been accounted for previously from this mined mercury source, um, our modeling results suggest that there's more, more of the mercury in the ocean and thus in fish is anthropogenic in origin than previously thought. And so we're still working on um, the exact the exact um, distribution in terms of an exact percentage between these two things, but we're very confident that the majority of the mercury in um, the upper ocean, so down to about 1,500 meters where most of the fish that we would consume live, um, the natural component is very small relative to the anthropogenic component. And as I said, um, this exact Distribution will depend on some of the assumptions we've used in our model, and so we're still improving that with new measurements, for example, um, on the terrestrial mercury cycle. So new measurements about how much mercury is retained in soils versus emitted back to the atmosphere from soils. And, but um, the uncertainty isn't large enough for this picture to be switched. So we're confident that most of the mercury in the upper ocean is from human activity. And this is, like I said, this is fairly recent work that we've done over the last few years. Um, but before that, in around 2008, um, the California government wanted tuna companies to be required to put the content of mercury in the tuna on the cans of tuna. But at that time, um, the tuna companies were able to argue that most or all of the mercury in the tuna was naturally occurring, and so therefore they didn't need to put out any label on the can. And so we think that if this had happened again today, they probably wouldn't be able to argue that because we have a lot more evidence now um, that this isn't the case. Okay, so looking towards the future, um, there's some positive notes that I want to end on, which is that we now have a global legally binding mercury treaty, which is called the Minamata Convention. And that is named after this um, unfortunate mass poisoning incident that I alluded to earlier in Minamata, Japan, where they were actually using methylmercury in manufacturing, which as I said, was very rare and was stopped very quickly after, after this incident. 
um, was discovered. And the reason we need a global treaty is not only because of something I mentioned farther at the beginning of the talk, which is that mercury in the elemental form can be transported globally through the atmosphere. But in addition, um, the fish that we eat, for example, in the in North and Central America is what this pot is showing. So the fish that we eat in the US, only 25% is coming locally. And so a lot of the, the fish is actually sourced from other continents and other ocean areas that are not uh, directly um, bordering us. And so we also need to think about that. So we do need a global action to reduce the amount of mercury that we're exposed to through fish consumption. And as of right now, um, there's 128 countries that have signed on to the treaty, and there's 11 countries that have ratified it. And actually, the United States is one of those 11. And this um, convention was just finalized uh, less than two years ago. So it still is pretty new, and they need 50 countries to ratify it for it to come into effect. But it has provisions like um, phasing out mercury mining and banning new mercury mining. It also phases out mercury in different products um, and uh, aims to reduce mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants, for example. And as I've mentioned, um, the largest source that we need to worry about today, not only for the source of the environment, but also the human health effects, is this artisanal and small-scale gold mining. Um, and this is already illegal in most places, so it will be hard to regulate, but we do have some hope. Um, there's these two different organizations. One is called Mercury Watch and the Artisanal Gold Council. And this is a photo taken from one of their efforts. Um, they're actually going out into areas where they know this is happening, and they're providing them with alternative technologies or teaching them about the dangers of mercury and trying to get them to recycle more of the mercury that they use and also reduce the mercury that they're breathing in. And so this is a huge focus right now, and I think that eventually as, as the sources of mercury, for example, as they phase out mercury mining with this treaty, um, this will also continue to decline. Um, but this is a major focus, as I mentioned. And so, uh, one thing I just want to drive home is that we do need aggressive controls of mercury to see declines in the ocean. And so what I'm showing here is a plot of mercury concentration in the upper ocean under different future emission scenarios. And so you see the, the constant emissions. So if we just kept emissions constant in the present day going forward to 2050, the mercury in the ocean would actually continue to rise. And this is because um, we still have the past mercury that's cycling between the air, the soil, and the ocean. And so because of this legacy, you don't see a decrease even though the mercury is staying constant, the mercury emissions are staying constant. If you added in aggressive mercury controls, you begin to see it turning around after a few decades. So that's very promising. And this uh, hypothetical scenario of zero mercury emissions, you see an immediate uh, but sort of slow decline. And so this is just suggesting that we really do need these aggressive global mercury treaties like the Minamata Convention. And we've seen in the US that mercury emissions from power plants have declined a lot um, over the last 10 years. So I'm showing here from 2005 to 2011. The gray is the total mercury emitted uh, from power plants in the US. And the top is the elemental form. And the bottom is these different mercury compounds. Um, and the reason for these declines is not really mercury-specific controls. That's this tiny blue section right here. It's actually because of other uh, regulations that were put into place predominantly to control acid rain. Um, so the things that are emitted from power plants that can make acid rain. But that actually had a co-benefit for mercury. And then some of this is because of switching to natural gas, which um, has very low mercury emissions relative to coal. And um, so this is hopeful for two reasons. One is that there's um, a lot of these types of more acid rain related controls are be uh, beginning to be implemented in developing countries like China. And so we'll see a, a benefit for mercury there. And in addition, there's now um, a mercury and air toxic standard uh, proposed in the United States, which would require mercury specific control technologies. And so then we would 
begin to see this blue chunk uh, get much larger and continue to reduce the mercury released from power plants. Um, so to summarize, some take home messages. Mercury is naturally occurring in rocks. It has many useful properties. It's been widely used going back thousands of years. The form that we worry about is this methylmercury form, which bioaccumulates up the food chain. It's the most toxic form, and we're, we can be exposed through eating fish that contains methylmercury. Um, based on our recent work, we think most of the mercury, both in the atmosphere and the upper ocean, and thus probably fish as well, is anthropogenic and not natural in origin. And we're still working on figuring out the exact proportion of those. And there's some global and national regulations that are really promising, and we're going to continue to have to focus on this artisanal gold mining, as that's the largest source today, and it seems like it's increasing. And I just want to end uh, with bringing it back to fish. Um, and this is something that's really difficult um, in the mercury community, because regulators have a really hard time trying to tell people what to do about fish because they find that either the advice that they give causes people to just not eat fish at all because it's too overwhelming or to just eat whatever fish they want because again it's just too much information um, and so this is something that I just want to draw attention to because fish can be a very important part of our nutrition they provide omega-3 fatty acids um, and there are fish that are high in these healthy acids that are also low in mercury. So it still is possible to eat fish and um, not be exposed to too much methylmercury. And so I have some, some wallet cards here that are developed by the National Natural Resource Defense Council, um, which can help you if you're trying to remember which are the fish that are low in mercury and high in omega-3 fatty acids and which are the fish that are low in omega-3 fatty acids and high in mercury. Um, and there are other sources of omega-3 fatty acids, and we can discuss that after the talk if you're interested. But I just want to make sure I'm not sending you away thinking that you should never eat fish again for the rest of your life. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and take any questions. So are you saying that the control they put in for the acid rain kind of took care of some of the mercury, but it wasn't doing 100% of the tire controls? Are going to have to pull up most of it out? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so your question is about the acid rain controls got rid of a lot of the mercury, but we actually do need the mercury controls to remove the rest. So they found that mercury specific controls for coal power plants can actually remove over 90% of the mercury that's emitted. So we could get to practically zero emissions of mercury from coal fired power plants, but it is a pretty expensive technology. So in the meantime, in developing countries, for example, these controls for other types of emissions will do a lot of work for the mercury. Yeah. In the box model, where do the numbers come from? So is each one like an aggregation of several papers feeding into it, or what assumptions are in there? Great. Um, so your question was about the uh, numbers that we use in the box modeling work, and where did those come from? So they are based on measurements. So if we can sort of get a rate constant based on, for example, if you're measuring fluxes from soils um, or reactions happening in the ocean, for example, and then for other things like the transfer time of mercury in the surface to the deep, we have a good understanding of that from observations of different tracers in the ocean of how long it takes for the mercury to be transported to the deep ocean. Um, so some of these do come from observations and some come from more sophisticated modeling studies. So if we have like a 3D spatially resolved model that um, reproduces observations well, and then we kind of trust, okay, maybe this is the rate constants that we should use for the exchange. And so some of the numbers are based on those more specific and detailed modeling studies. Um, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Is somebody considering going back to the, uh, the fish industry and, and trying to get them to uh, put the long period of fish? 
Yeah, um, so your question was whether someone's going to try to go back to the fish industry and get them to do labeling or something like that. Um, I haven't been following it very closely, but I do think there's there's been some more recent um, cases since then, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that definitely has come up because if someone doesn't know about mercury and fish for whatever reason and tuna fish is really cheap and it's something you can eat a lot of, um, you could end up being exposed to and having health effects from just that. And there's been evidence of that. Um, like there was a woman that was eating just several cans of tuna fish a day and ended up with mercury poisoning symptoms. So she was really upset that there was no label on the tuna fish can warning her about this because she didn't have another way of figuring that out. So I'm not really sure what will happen with that. Um, but I think these, this type of information is a good place to start um, to try to learn about what types of fish are good for you. But yeah, I don't remember who was first. Maybe I'll go this way, left to right. Sorry. Okay, so this uh, case with like bumblebee, mm -hmm. uh, was that only in California? So do they have labeling like let's say here, Massachusetts, or is it just for everywhere? So this was specifically in California. Um, there is not labeling everywhere, and that was another reason that it got thrown out, was they were saying, well, the federal government doesn't require this, so it would be different just for California, and that was one of their reasonings as well. So as far as I'm aware, it's not anywhere. Yeah? Um, is, the, is the reason why there was incidents in Japan because they're eating raw fish in sushi? That's a good question. So um, her question was whether the incident in Japan was because they're eating raw sushi. And so this specific um, poisoning event that occurred in the Minamata Bay in Japan was because of a factory that was actually using the methylmercury form, which as I've said is very rare. It's not generally been used in manufacturing processes, but it was being used uh, for chemical manufacturing and they were just directly disposing waste that contained much higher levels of methylmercury than you would find typically in the ocean into a relatively enclosed bay. And so in this bay, the methylmercury concentrations were very, very high. And it was actually even killing the fish in the bay. And they started noticing that their cats were acting funny, that were eating some of the fish. And it ended up that because they were eating fish from this really contaminated bay, there were a lot of serious health effects that happened from it. So it wasn't, um, today, even though people in Japan are probably eating more sushi than we are, um, it's not coming from this sort of really contaminated local environment. Yeah. Um, so in your picture that is a lot how high in the food chain the fish you were eating. Was. Yeah. And so my question is whether the, are the farm raised fish that we are offered in the grocery store, are they um, are they in fact artificially lower on the food chain because they're not top-of-the-chain predators in the open ocean, they're being fed, you know, mm. uh, chicken poop? Or, like, what's the, what's the story for the effective mm. position of, of the farm-raised fish in the food chain with respect to mercury concentration? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, just to repeat your question, um, asking about whether farm-raised fish, because they might be being fed chicken feed or something like that and not what they would normally be eating out in the open ocean, are they on effectively on a lower level of the food chain? Um, I'm not sure about that. One issue that comes up with certain types of farm-raised fish is actually other chemical compounds like PCBs. And so that is something that is mentioned on this wallet card, but it doesn't, I don't know if it distinguishes between farm-raised versus open water fish for mercury specifically. Just sort of like a follow up on that question, uh, on like the Japan incident. Did that company get in trouble with uh, uh, J the Japan's government or did people sue it and what happened to it in connection with that? Yeah, so your question is about the poisoning in Japan. Did the company get punished in any way? What happened? Um, and so it's a pretty sad story. It, it, they're still actually dealing with that today, even though this was happening in the 50s and 60s. Um, and they were really in denial that they were responsible 
for a long time, this particular manufacturing plant, but at this point they are paying reparations to the families that were affected. But the issue is that they've only recognized a couple thousand cases and there's probably many more people than that that were affected that are not getting any benefit um, from the specific company. But it still is, seems to be ongoing. But, um, and that's sort of why it's a big deal that they've named this global treaty the Minamata Convention. Any other questions? Okay, well, feel free to come up and take a wallet card. Um, there's a couple different versions, or come and ask me any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you.